Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 13 for Blueprint for Closers. My name is Dominic Ciccarelli with Think Design Architecture. As usual, with my co host, Rob Nixon from PreRail. What's up, Rob? How you doing? Uh, today, we have Billy Lesh with us from the Baya Bar franchise. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, not only his franchise and his eating and drinking um, business, but we'll be talking about negotiating leases and some of the pitfalls and tips to a tenant finding real estate for their business. Um, before we get started into that, uh, we always like to find out and learn a little bit more about you. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Billy, You know where you're from, and kind of how you got to this endeavor. Yeah, so I uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Bay Ridge, to be very specific. And uh, from an early age, I always wanted to go into business for myself, be an entrepreneur, right? Entrepreneur got kind of cool, like within the last eight to 10 years. But when you're a kid, you don't really know what that means, right? I just knew I wanted to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so my friend and I, at about six, seven years old, it was like first or second grade, we started selling these little tchotchke items from Oriental Trading Magazine to kids in school. So we would buy like a hundred whatever for a penny each, and we'd sell them for a nickel each or for a dime each. Very from cool. a from a profit margin standpoint, <laughs> the most profitable profitable business I've done to date. Um, did that for for you know like a year or two at school. Um, then in high school, we started a company called Brooklyn Home and Store Improvement. Went around Bay Ridge, power washing, um, painting, doing odds and end jobs like that for businesses and for homes. Very cool. Again, did very well doing that at 15 and 16 years old. Um, from there, went to college, Monmouth University, not too far from here, and started a company called Learn Green, Earn Green. Um, and what the purpose of that was, was to bring recycling programs to businesses and schools that use private sanitation. What a lot of people don't know is private sanitation does not recycle. Mm. So if you see a recycling bin in a business, it's a farce, basically. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that later. So um, I provided gar uh, recycling bins. I don't know if I've ever told you this. No. I, I, I provided recycling bins to Zavarian, my high school, for free. We collected all of the recycling for free. And then we brought it to a redemption center. And we redeemed all the bottles and cans for money. Very cool. Um, and the thought process was it's a no-brainer for the schools. We are you know, offering recycling. We're picking it up for free, and we're going to give a portion of the proceeds back in the form of a scholarship. So we piloted it at Zavarian, and it went very well. But we very quickly realized we were in waste management. Right. <laughs> so um, my buddy and I, who, who again, Oriental Trading Magazine, Brooklyn Home and Store Improvement, and now Learn Green, Earn Green, he was getting started in his world. I was getting started on Wall Street. And we decided to leave this business um, and, and check it out at a later date in life. Um, graduated college and went down onto Wall Street. And I was down on Wall Street for about four years and change. Um, got my Series 7, Series 63, and started selling uh, stocks, basically, on Wall Street. And uh, What years were we talking? Um, I graduated college in 2012. So I went down to Wall Street about twenty end of twenty twelve. So a relatively good market. Yeah, you were coming back out out of that recession yeah. from two thousand eight. Things were good, and then in in two thousand sixteen things went bad, right. especially in oil and gas. Um, so the the mixture of oil and gas tanking, and just you know not having a lot of great luck with our the investments I was involved in, I was really really disheartened. I decided to leave Wall Street in two thousand sixteen. And that's when I started looking for the next venture. That's when I think I met you, roughly, or maybe 2018. Well, we probably met after it was down on 2016. Street. Oh, yeah, so it was 2017. Mm -hmm. 2017. Um, started looking for different opportunities, and there was an opportunity to bring acai bowls mm -hmm. and that whole genre to Brooklyn, which I feel is one of the best markets in the world. And how'd you find that? How'd I find what? Acai, acai bowls. bowls, yeah. Well, I had tried it numerous times on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. There were a few brands that were popping up on the East Coast, mainly in New Jersey and Long Island. 
but there was nothing in the five boroughs. So I'm saying to myself, you know, this brand's having success in New Jersey. This other brand's having success in Long Island. There's all these brands on the West Coast. Why nothing in the five boroughs? Right. How far ahead was the West Coast? Five years, 10 years? If I had to predict, I think they were about three to four years ahead, okay. three to five years. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other brands in New Jersey and Long Island were about two, two three years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. um, so just started doing a ton of research and development. And I approach any business, but this business specifically with a kind of a very straightforward, common sense approach. Mm -hmm. If we offer a high quality product and it looks nice and it tastes good, we'll probably do pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, so no food and beverage background. Went into the Acai Bowl business, started by a bar. And that was December 28th, 2016. So we're about a week and a half away from seven years. And fast forward to today, 26 location locations open with another two dozen under contract. And uh, we were just ranked number one Acai Bowl franchise by Entrepreneur Magazine. Ah, that's great, man. Unbelievable. Congratulations. I not only had the pleasure of meeting you and doing store one, but yes. I've been involved in every single store since then. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, this first space he took in Bay Ridge, you know, where he grew up, um, I actually knew the tenant that was there prior. And that he made the connection to us. And uh, we opened up the store. And uh, about a month or two later, he called me up. He's like, we're doing another one. So it was it was exciting from the beginning, you know, seeing something from nothing become something. It's a cool you know? story, yeah. Are yeah. They, uh, they all in the boroughs? So predominantly in the five boroughs, mm -hmm. we have Louisiana, Utah, and now going into 2024, we have a lot of locations that are starting to come up outside of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Florida, um, uh, Georgia, we have some interest, Wisconsin. So it's, it's now we're really starting to build momentum, but uh, predominantly in New York right now. So tell us about buy a bar specifically now, right? So obviously it's acai bowls, but I think you guys do a lot more than that. Yeah. And and talk to me about as time marches on and maybe trends change a little bit, what do you classify buy a bar as? And what do you see it as the future? That's a great question. So from a product standpoint, we sell acai bowls, coconut bowls, and pitaya bowls. And for those who don't know, you know, it's the acai bowl is an acai base. It's almost like a thick sorbet. Mm -hmm. And it comes with all fresh fruits and toppings on top. Um, along with the bowls, we do smoothies, protein shakes, fresh juices, cold pressed juices, avocado toast. And now we're launching a full coffee line. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Co Very so this is one of the things that we're transitioning to. And, ju and you're doing juicing. Yes. Fresh juicing and, and cold pressed. Yeah, yeah. I've tried a bunch of them. Don't you so. have oatmeal too? We do have oatmeal, yeah. So we have some more grab-and-go style items like the oatmeals and the granola bars and things like that. But the, the main crux of our products are the bowls, the smoothies, and the juices. And it's funny, the, the question that a lot of people ask us is, aren't you worried that acai bowls are a trend? Um, and my response is always this. Smoothies and juices, smoothie shops and juice bars have been around predominantly since the 60s and 70s. Great business model, plenty of locations for various brands. Acai bowls, coconut bowls, pitaya bowls, and all of the other bowls that come onto the menu um, are basically just a complementary enhancement to that already successful business model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you're actually offering a bona fide meal replacement. So people that would maybe have a protein shake after the gym or or a smoothie for you know for breakfast, now they're coming in for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and eating these bowls. So we've actually taken an already existing proven business model and just enhanced it and widened the audience. Um, I obviously wasn't the pioneer of that, but that's why I believed in the model from day one. And now we're trying to adapt it and grow it by bringing in coffee and making it, bringing in some of that cafe style um, items. So going from way back, right? So I'm curious how the franchise has evolved and how it even became, you know, how you decided to start franchising. But going way back, right? You're coming off of Wall Street. You like this concept. Where do you go and where do you start? How do you find acai suppliers? Where do you find your granola? All these things. How does that work? It's funny, man. I, I don't know if I'm smart or if I'm just delusional. I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> but I just called everybody that I could think of. I went into businesses that I had, you know, relationships with the owners, friends, or, you know, fam family member of a friend. 
And I just asked a ton of questions and I used this magical thing. I don't know if you've heard of it, Google. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just looked up, uh, you know, frozen fruit suppliers, granola suppliers, and I just started calling everybody. And then what I took from Wall Street was... Well, I always had the gift of gab, but I took the negotiation skills from Wall Street. And they don't give up. And I brought that into food and beverage where these guys are like, oh, my God, this kid's beating me up. over." Right. So we negotiated really good deals. And it was really just vetting out a lot of people. And then as you grow and you scale, as you know, um, you know, you you adapt and you get rid of certain people that aren't working. You bring in certain people that are better. Um, but we've really, you know. It was just trial and error calling and just trying out different vendors and just seeing what worked and then doing just the old school flavor test, just trying different products mm -hmm. and just say, saying, you know, what tastes better, what looks better. Um, and then bringing a product that I thought was really well to the market, testing it out with family and friends. And then once they confirmed that 95 percent of what I thought was real was real, then we opened. Yeah, there's no question. It's a huge demographic. I mean. Everyone leaving the gym is coming by, oh, yeah, hitting yeah. the smoothies. Every kid after school is taking the train to the locus, the lo the the closest by a bar, yeah, and they're grabbing these these uh, bowls. So, um, you know, I think you you want to hit the breakfast, lunch, and dinner crowds, obviously maximize your sales. But I think that this business isn't catering to just one. You know, it's not just for kids, or it's not just for adults. It's not just for guys into fitness. It's a it's a it's a, a full fledged you know restaurant providing food on a takeout basis, right? Right. Um, so I think you definitely hit on the head with respect to meeting everyone's needs. All right. So this was 2017, first location. Tw 20, well, the all of the R&D started in 2016. Okay. Um, I would say summer of 2016. Okay. I left Wall Street April, May of 2016. So it really started ramping up the, the research and development and the build out in the summer of 2016. And then opened the first store December 28th. So at the very end of 2016, um, and then by the end of 2017, we had opened two more locations. So we had three within the first 12 months. And and then from there, you how many more corporate stores did you open before deciding of you know franchising? We got up to about five or six corporate locations, and then decided let's start franchising. Was that always the plan, or that was the only way to scale? Any business I get into, I do the billion dollar test. It's like Bron Bronx Tale, the Mario test. This is <laughs> the Billy <laughs> test. So I said to myself, I might not hit it, but what is the pathway to a billion dollars? I think you could figure out in any business. And if there's a business that doesn't have that answer, then it's not a business I'm personally interested in. So in this business, it was two ways. Franchising. Mm-hmm. And blowing it out of the water like McDonald's, right? Everyone uses McDonald's as the comparison. Or going the private side, like a Starbucks or a Chipotle, and raising a bunch of capital and just you know rolling out a ton of corporate locations. Um, I felt that the path of least resistance would be franchising. Lower risk, lower reward on a store-by-store -store basis, but scaling it to the size that I wanted to scale it to much faster. So that was always the the plan from day one. Um, and then, you know, once there was proof of concept and we had three locations that were doing really well, mm. then it was, okay, let's now let's really pursue this. Right. And then we started, you know, getting a lot of people reaching out too. So those, you know, what was it? Five corporate stores basically you got it yeah, to? Yeah, it was five. I'm pretty sure it was five. So did you, you know, bootstrap it and come up with the capital yourself? Did you raise money at that time? I, I'm proud to say that seven years into this thing, a week and a half out from seven years, we've never taken a dollar from any outsiders uh we've bootstrapped it from day one and after year one the three locations really funded everything that's super cool man we should yeah. be super proud of that yeah yeah so it's impressive I, I i don't think of it lightly because it, it you know things went well in the early days so you kind of don't think about it but for so many people that's not the case so i recognize how lucky we were um, in the early days that we were able to bootstrap this thing and get it to where it is today. I design and work with a lot of restaurateurs. And what was super unique about this business was a lot of the expenses to owning a restaurant is the gas line, Ansel, the hood, absolutely. Ansel systems, annual boiler, uh, fire inspections, all this kind of stuff. Where this business, there's no cooking on premises. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the spaces we've designed are, are smaller than the studio. Yeah. And... 
and they're producing the same amount of sales as restaurants do that actually have to have a full gas range cooking menu, cooking on premises. And that's what's super unique about business, this business compared to other eating and drinking type spots throughout the city. Right. Yeah. From, from a real estate standpoint, um, small square footage, you know, our number one store in the company is 450, 500 square foot store. Where is that? I won't say. Okay. Um, it's in the New York market, but, um, small location and just like Dom just said, from, you know, from a landlord perspective, they love when we make an offer on a space because there's no cooking, there's Absolutely. no grease, there's Makes no so raw fo- yep. food. Yep. The the risk for bugs and, and rodents and things like that is yes, almost non-existent. Yeah. Fires, non-existent. Um, health department, you know, they, they try to find things wrong with our places. It's very hard for them to find something mm-hmm. wrong. And we really are a phenomenal amenity to any building that we go to or any block. So from, from a real estate standpoint, we're getting small square foot spaces and landlords are really loving everything that we're doing. What's also great about the small footprint is he doesn't need his own dedicated space. So he can be an accessory to a gym, right? He could be the juice spot in the gym in like a plug and play scenario. Right. He could be in a supermarket, right? Just just carve out a little 400, mm-hmm. area, 400 square foot area for him. And that's the juice bar area. Right. right. So I think right. a lot of diversity on how you can actually plug the business in. Almost Correct. like you see Starbucks plugging going into and Dunkin' Donuts going into supermarkets. You could start plugging buy bars into supermarkets. Correct. Right? Correct. So you go the franchising route, right? So now, obviously, you're looking to, I, I imagine, grow as fast as you can within reason, right? So um, what do you look for in a, in a franchisee? What does it take to become one? You know, there, there's no perfect franchisee. What I've learned is every human being that I've come in contact with within Biobar's ecosystem or not is their own, you know, their own individual person. You have to really get to know what makes somebody tick. So when a franchisee comes on board, I like to know what their vision of our relationship of franchisor or franchisee is in their mind. Are they looking to leave their nine to five that they hate? And they just want to be in a store, old school, work five, six days a week in this location, and it's their life. Do they really believe in the concept and they want to invest, you know, a million dollars and they want to mm-hmm. open up four, five, six locations and they want this as a an extra revenue stream? Or are they a big real estate holder and they want to plug buy a bars into 26 shopping centers. So everybody's different. However, what I've seen over the course of seven years is the best franchisees we have are owner operators, people who are very, very hands on with the business. They care about it. Yes. I think one of the things that we've lost in the United States is that hands on customer service hospitality. And it's the pride. I, correct. It's it's also and, and I'll say this as playing devil's advocate. We have corporate locations. Our staff is trained to a high standard, but they still don't own the store. They don't have the right to give away products or give special discounts like an owner does. So they don't have the right to do that. And that can get very murky if you give them the right to do that. But when you do little things like that, when it's appropriate, that's how you build a loyal customer base. So our stores that have owner operators really outperform the stores that don't. Um, So we're really looking for franchisees that want to be hands on. So we, it's, it's it's just so true about how the world, like just how everything has changed. I mean, we, we were at a breakfast meeting this morning of a mastermind group we have and so many guys in the room, you know, grew up or just started businesses 14 hours a day, whatever it took. They, for the most part, a lot of them are looking to exit the businesses. None of the kids want it. Nobody wants to put in that kind of work anymore. And it's just, it's just so different. It's, it's really changed. And all of those business owners really came from, you know, hardworking families, you know, from all the blue collar families or, or working class mm-hmm. people. And they kind of took it to the next level. And it goes back to that 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 cycle, right? Where you have you have the, the person who kind of takes it to the next level, then the second generation kind of skates, and then the next generation kind of loses all the money, and then it has to start again, where yeah. okay, now you have that hunger in your body, you you start your stomach again to kind of earn. Yeah. So it's really hard. And I think about this all the time with my kids. Like, how do I keep make them as motivated as I was motivated to do something when they didn't have the struggles that I had. Right. Like you knew at a young age, I want to be rich, make a lot of money. Right. You said that earlier. Yeah. But there were things in your life that happened that gave you that motivation. Well, 
you know, and, and we can go on a tangent on this and it's probably a conversation for another podcast, another day. But I think the problem with kids today is that people aren't understanding what they like, right? Like for the longest time, it was loyalty to family, loyalty to country, hard work. And now we're in this weird place where that doesn't really exist anymore. So the big problem is kids are not doing what they want to do. Their parents are not letting them do what they want to do. And they're just rejecting it. And I don't think it's a kid problem. I think it's a, I think it's a parent problem. I it's, agree. It's so true. I mean, you had the post, post-war, right? And that, there was a trend that happened for uh, 40 years plus. And then, some, and then most of those people wanted their kids to go to college because that was the right thing to do. I think in many cases, college is not valuable. You know, we've gotten away from so many things that are so valuable, like trades. I mean, it just nobody wants to. I mean, you're just you're spot on with that. I, I encourage, you know, friends that I have that have kids that and I probably said this to you before, like there are, you know, tests you could take, you know, Myers-Briggs, certain things to like figure out what kids, you know, what kids might be good at. Mm-hmm. So you can maybe start steering them through that because it, or if nothing else to figure out what they don't want to do so you can get there, because otherwise you get all these people that are going to college at an undergrad school that. Is okay, right? And they have no idea what they're doing. It was frowned upon to be, oh, an electrician or a plumber. Like, no, go to school. That's where they make all the money. They're they're the ones that make the money. Those are the guys crushing it right now. You know how many doctors I know that are getting into the construction business? Well, they're buying real estate. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like you just said that at the mastermind meeting, there's people that are getting out of the business. That's my next thing. You know, in conjunction with buy a bar or post buy a bar, it's going to be buying businesses like Set, that totally agree. great great mm-hmm. great model that you know there's a lot of these guys they're just going to close because no one's taking over the business and a lot of these guys like i think of my father smart guy grew up you know was born in the late 50s grew up in brooklyn in the 70s 80s 90s these guys don't know how to pull p and l's and get ebitda and get valuation reports done and sell a company the correct way they're just simply saying hey you know i make a couple hundred grand a year you know, give, give me two times that and I'll walk away. Right. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of real good deals to be made. And I think if guys like us put together groups with with ops guys, we can bring multiple businesses under one umbrella and absolutely crush it. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And 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 a big part of that, right, is, I mean, and again, we're going, we're going off tangent here, but there's two ways to grow a business. There's a grow business for to ultimately sell or exit at some point, right? And there's a bit, there's running a business for, to support your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Almost always, not almost always, but in many cases, it's the second. And those p- businesses are not at all positioned to sell. Well, I'm glad he just said that because when we were talking about the kid thing, a conversation I constantly have with employees, you know, I've, there's a lot of employees company wide at buy a bar over 150 probably. And so many times these employees, they're younger kids, not all the time. They'll ask me for advice. And I always say to them, well, what do you want? Do you want to do something you really like or do you want to make a lot of money? Mm -hmm. Because when you're starting out, they might not align. For me, I want to make a lot of money right now. Mm -hmm. I'll shovel horse shit if you're going to pay me the right number. A lot of kids don't want to do that. They want to have both. And what I'm telling them is you either to start pick something that aligns with what you are, what you need today to fulfill today. And then, and then the rest will kind of follow. Sometimes you do something you don't like, but you make enough money that you can then have the freedom to make a decision. Right. Or you don't care about money and you're accepting of that and you follow a passion and then you make money because you're following your passion. I read a thing years ago and it always stuck with me. 20s are for learning, 30s are for earning. And I'm just such a believer in that. Yeah. You know, take your 20s to just work, figure it out. Like, I, everything. I'm going to make my, I mean, I have a daughter, you know, we all have kids, right? Our kids are young. Um, I'm going to make my daughter intern for companies f- for free Same. for at least six years post college. If she even goes to college, mm-hmm. I'm just going to say, and we could watch this in 15 years, go work for this guy or this woman for free. Learn, absorb. Because if you're not taking anything from them monetarily, they're probably going to give you a shot. Oh, like it's, it's a no brainer for me. Mm-hmm. This kid, is super loyal, wants to work hard, and is not asking for anything. Yeah. What is that going to turn into? Yeah. We all own businesses. I know today if that happens to me, in seven years and 150 employees, I've not had one ever say to me, can I come work for you for free five days a week? It hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. I've had about five over the years. I have 150-ish employees company-wide today, 
But thinking about over seven years, probably four or five X that, if not more, I've had about five or six say, hey, can I make some extra money and help you with anything? And those people hold a higher regard in my sure. mind, you know? Yeah. Another thing I like to also focus on with my kids is there was so much pressure on so many families. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a politician. But you know what? Happiness is, is completely ignored in the whole equation, yeah. right? So I'm taking almost a, a little bit more of a passive approach where, listen, you can be anything you want to be, right? I'm not putting that pressure on you, but I need you to be happy. And if I could teach my children to find happiness within and maybe not through something else or, uh, or someone else, I think I was successful. Just be happy in life. That's what I think this world's missing. Everyone's popping a pill and everyone's doing this. And, and listen, be happy. But with that said, whatever life you choose, whatever career you choose, your life will match it. Mm -hmm. So don't right, take right. the job at McDonald's and want a vacation to South of France every year. Right. Right. So it's a delicate balance. What life do you want to live compared to the career you want to have? And I'll say something because a lot of people don't say what I'm about to say. When you do the vacation in the South of France a few times, you also realize that that, that kind of fucking doesn't matter either. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like when you get to that on the other side of it where you're like, yeah, I kind of rather just have a relaxed Right. 345 days out of the year. Right. And not do the 20 days of vacations. Right. Know your kid or the kid needs to know himself. Correct. What they want. Correct. Right. So that's why I'm happy doing anything. What did you but make sure, be? Your li make sure your lifestyle is going to be want to be. Listen, I I always enjoyed art. Okay. I always enjoyed playing ice hockey. Okay. Um, I kind of got lucky where I was able to pursue my, my art and find a business that made money. Right. I'm not a starving artist. I can, I can draw a pretty building. So I'm drawing and I have a business out of it. Um, but listen, my, the heavy push in my family was to be a fireman and a cop. You know, mm -hmm. I come from a, yeah, a huge family Same. of firemen and cops like the, like the, like the us here at the table. And they made me take all those tests and I took them. And you know what? I was called three times for the fire department. I told them three times. Likewise. No, very difficult decision, especially the last time. But sometimes you have to just, you know, see my dad make was some a retired cop though, but never w wanted me to go that route at all. Yeah. Encouraged me to do the dead opposite. Right. It's funny. My father was, is a retired cop also. Wanted me to go that route. Said fireman's the better job, actually. Fireman's definitely the better job. <laughs> what did you want to be when you were younger? Uh, oh, for the most part, I always wanted to own my own business. I started my first business when I was 11. Uh, like you, I had I actually had a landscaping business. I did like 15 lawns in the neighborhood. And then I did a business called Water Boys, which we basically did pressure washing. That's great. And painting. That's what we were doing. With, like 15. With, that's so funny. And... Uh, and that, so I wanted to, um, at one point I really wanted to own car washes. For some reason that's just something I wanted to do. I, uh, I, then I really, my mom wanted me to go like kind of down wall street. Right. And I, uh, so I did want to do that for a time. And I actually always loved real estate. Just didn't really know, you know, where to go that route because that's like, that's, a, that's a good example of a profession. They don't really teach you how to be one or it's not. It's not really talked about, right? There's just right. there's so many things that just there's no emphasis on it in school. They don't teach you how to use money. They don't. It, it, there's just there's no financial yeah. literacy. There's no how to balance a checkbook. Mm -hmm. It's I mean the the whole education system is broken in so many ways, in my opinion. Um, but getting back to Baya, right? So now <laughs> I wanted to be an architect, by the way. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Did you? Okay. An interior designer and architect. Okay. Listen, you 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 create the uh, yeah you create, you create the pat the 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 look of buyer. Yeah. I mean, you know. So, do you put any requirements in place for franchisees? Like, do they have to open a certain amount in any certain time? That kind of thing. I know that exists. Well, now that we're getting to the size that we're at, now um, outside of the New York market, we're not really taking less than three units. Okay. Uh, depending on the location, mm -hmm. you know, the further out we go, the the bigger the requirement. And if you want to be a franchisee, do you get a territory? Does, how does that work? Yeah, so you have a protected territory in and around the location. Yeah. And then typically what we do as a, as a gesture of good faith is a right of first refusal on one or two other territories that they're interested in for growth outside of the two or three that they commit mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we're, we're at this size and we're going into 2024 with a lot of stores slated to come, um, now we're only doing multi-units. Predominantly, unless it's something really unique. So why should I want to become a franchisee? You know, what do you think that ultimately bio offers versus other franchises? Because I go to the franchise convention every year and I haven't, aside from maybe this year, I've seen some cooler concepts, but 
I, I think that you have a really great model and uh, I, it, I think it, it offers, I think it's approachable. I think it's affordable in comparison to some of the, the others, um, but I'd love to hear your side of it. Number one, low cost investment. You really can't get into food and beverage for less than 250,000, very unlikely. Most of my competitors are in the three, four, 500K range. We are opening up stores anywhere, all in cost, franchise fee, build out costs, stocking the store, marketing, anywhere from 175 to two and a quarter. Build so, out time is typically what? Um, build out times, if things go well, two to three months. Which I can speak as somebody who does a lot of hospitality leasing, food is usually minimum, minimum six to 12 months. It takes you three months just to order the equipment. Right. Correct. Minimum six to 12 minutes, months, so that's awesome. So we're, we're doing a lot of fun stuff in regards to our design, our build outs. Um, when we negotiate leases and I bring Dom on board, I'm willing to put a little money up front to have the places measured um, correctly. We pull ACP fives immediately. Mm -hmm. we, it's actually a requirement from the landlord for, from us. You need to give us an ACP five within 10 days of signing the lease. For those who don't know, that's what? That's the asbestos report. Right. So the reason he does this, and he's one of the only guys I know to do it, and again, maybe it takes 30 stores to get there and, and get, get beat up a little bit, is what if you take over that space? And there's language in the lease which protects you. What if you take over the lease? Now there's time restraints to open, right? And you test, because New York City requires you test for asbestos before you get a building permit, and what if it's positive for asbestos? Mm. It creates another whole level of complications. Well, who's responsible to abate it? What about the time to abate it? It puts a complete pause on the project. So it's easy to cut through the red tape, provide me a clean report first, then I'll get started. Right. Okay. So, so you do that. Yeah, no. so what we're doing is you have to give us an ACP5 within 10 days of signing, or else our lease commencement date keeps getting pushed back. So typically with um, our leases, I'm negotiating... Anywhere from four to six months of rent abatement, okay. uh, ACP five within 10 days of signing, and then TI money. Depending on the size of the space and the scope of work, we're negotiating. I mean, it ranges anywhere from, it could be 25,000. We've had offers of over 100,000 in TI money, um, tenant improvement money, right, for anyone who's listening. Um, but the ACP five, aside from if there's asbestos, who's fixing it, mm -hmm. we can miss grand opening deadlines. We want to open for the spring and summer. So mm -hmm. even if they pay for everything, it might hurt our grand opening. But even if there's no asbestos, just to pull that report and then wait for the lab results, it delays us anywhere from four to six weeks. So it's an, an extra way to save our franchisees time and money and get those stores open quickly. And if quickly. it comes back positive, you, you know, day one, you may just want to pass. Correct. I mean, I've seen pr pr Correct. remediation projects that oh, know, yeah. cost... Did, Hundred grand, if not more. Yeah. I've right. seen some more yeah. horror stories. Right. So that's a, that's great. And we 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 do all the layouts and designs in house. So we'll measure the space out and do a rough design, mm -hmm. and then we send it over to Dom, and then he'll plug it all in and make it look nice, um, and then we'll fire that off to the landlord and get approval, and we get rocking and rolling fairly quickly. Bill, when you're when you're looking for new locations, right? Um, obviously you're dealing with a lot of different landlords, a lot of different types of real estate agents or brokers. How, do you first identify an area based on a demographic study? And then you say, okay, you reach out to a local agent in that area and say, okay, this is what I'm looking for. And then they come back to you or, right? Like like if you wake up tomorrow and say, I want to open up another store, like how you choose in the location. And going a step further than that, right? Because you mentioned earlier, franchisee, franchisor relationship. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? I buy I buy a, um, a territory, you know, who who's doing it? Who's responsible for what? That's I think that's interesting. So I, I am extremely hands-on. Number one, my energy level. Number two, I want to be, I like it. I really do enjoy what I do. I, on Friday, last Friday, I went and spent the entire day in Queens with a prospective franchisee. It was the first time we ever met in person. We had talked on the phone a few times. And at the end of the day, we found a location, submitted an LOI, and he turned to me and he said, do you do this with every franchisee? And I'm like, kind of, yeah. I said, not all the time, you, I think you're a phenomenal potential franchisee and I don't personally know the Queens market. So I wanted to get my own feel for it. Um, but I, you know, so I kind of told him like, not, not all the time, but I do, but really in reflecting on that answer, I, I really am so hands-on with every location. So where do we start? Number one, we look at demographics. Um, what we found and not to give too much of our secret sauce 
is certain population density results in good stores. Post COVID, we're doing about 30% delivery. So really? yeah. So highly, you know, high density of population is always going to be a plus. Um, I like to look at defined borders to see what's on the sides of us and what's above and below us on the map, what it makes a neighborhood a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least is flow. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick, funny story. When I built my house, my uncle came over and he looks and acts like Vince Vaughn. He's hysterical. And I gave him the whole layout of the house and he started yelling, no flow. There's, there's no flow here. I'm like, what do you mean there's no flow? He goes, you can't walk from the kitchen to the sunroom. You have to go around the island. There's no flow. So I eliminated it. And that, for some reason, stuck with me. So whenever I look at a location, I look at the flow of traffic. And we went down to Atlanta. We looked at a site. And what does every realtor do? They send you this little prospectus, no offense, um, with uh, the demographics of the area, the income, the amount of people, how many cars drive by per day. But they don't know, they don't talk about the flow. So we're at this location and it's in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, right across from Georgia Tech University. And we're on Spring is the avenue. And we're between 9th and 10th Street. And there's this brand new building that just went up and the demographics are through the roofs through the roof. It's unbelievable demographics. 10th Street has an overpass that goes from this side of the highway into Georgia Tech's campus. And there's tons of cars. So I walk down from Spring to the next avenue. It's called Williams. And I look to the right and I see the overpass and I look to the left. And four or five blocks away, I see another overpass. And I'm like, hmm, what's that? So the franchisee I was with didn't know. She's like, oh, I think there's another overpass over there. Let's go check it out. We go four blocks to Fifth Street. There's another overpass that goes into the campus. Loaded with people walking. Why? Why there's so many people here on Fifth Street, but not on 10th Street, five blocks away. And it was because what I figured out is on 10th Street, there was an on-ramp on one side of the highway. And there was an off ramp on one side of the highway. So you have people driving 60, 70 miles an hour on and off of an interstate. Well, you know who doesn't want to walk across cars going 60 miles an hour? 17 and 18 year old kids. They want to take a nice leisurely walk or a bike ride on the overpass that has no cars. Mm -hmm. So I realized very quickly, all of the flow was on fifth. And lo and behold, there was Starbucks and there was Buffalo Wild Wings and everybody. So from a demographic standpoint, identical, couldn't be further apart in terms of flow. Right. I, I mean, it's it's so true. I mean, AM, PM traffic. I mean, there's so many things that brokers don't even, yeah, just don't because, even know. Just because the space is the closest to the campus doesn't mean it's the right spot. Right. Right. So what's the relationship like now? Uh, so a location's found, you help them negotiate a lease. Um what is it? I mean, you, they basically buy all their materials and you guys buy all the supplies and everything from the same place. And you take a percentage of uh, whatever the business does and you assist with marketing. Correct. So we typically will have our guys do the build out. So our franchisees, what I like to tell all of them is we will hold your hand every step of the way. We will basically almost do everything for you unless there's certain things that you have a particular area of expertise in. If your brother owns a kitchen supply shop, we of, of course can get the equipment from him, right? Um, but by and large, they want to use our people because there's no mistakes made. We've done it so many times. Once the store is open, we help them with hiring. We do all of the training with them. We do corporate backend training and in-store hands-on training. We typically will take their key people and train them in an existing buy a bar. And then when we open, we go there for a kind of like a two, three day period to make sure that the store's set up correct. Mm -hmm. Then we do a one, uh, it's usually a two day training. Then that flows into a soft opening and then that goes right into the grand opening. Mm -hmm. And we handle all of the marketing. Um, we're with them on the grand opening day. And then beyond that, we're their support system with any questions, comments, concerns, troubleshooting issues you know it's a brick and mortar business so there's always problems mm -hmm. and we're just there every step of the way forever 
for a franchisee. So the lease is with them. Uh, is there any connection back to corporate? Uh, no. So we don't, you know, we've had a few times where landlords want us to go on the corporate guarantee. Right. And we sometimes will consider doing it for a short period of time. Right. So if the good guy clause is like 12 months, we'll go on as a co-guarantor for those 12 months and then we'll come off. Okay. What other negotiating tips would you recommend for both the landlord and the tenant for, you know, when, when, a, when a restaurateur or a business wants to come into the space? Like what are the top five things, I guess, are, are the, the repeat conversations you end up having and become, the, what are the issues? Well, I think a lot of tenants and landlords are penny wise and dollar foolish. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's a deal killer. I have a deal right now, the deal in Queens that we put an LOI on, on Friday. Um, they don't want to pay the brokers their commission. So Who's the, they, the landlord? The landlord. So the brokers are huge brokers from, from Manhattan that brought us the store. And they're like, yeah, our firm won't even accept those deals, uh, those terms. So um, what always comes up? Build out. Um, from a, you know, just giving blanketed advice to both tenant and landlord, there are certain things that as the tenant, we don't take with us if we leave. Whether the bit store doesn't do well in that location or at the end of 10 years, you decide not to renew us. We're putting all this money into the location. And I use high quality products. I use porcelain tile. We do all brand new electric and plumbing. We're typically upgrading the electric in the space. There's one thing that's always a problem and it's HVAC. Mm -hmm. So a lot of landlords don't want to spend the money to install the HVAC or they want to give you um, the language in the lease that they like to put is good working order. <laughs> <laughs> it's like pumping testosterone into a corpse. Um, yeah, it could be in good working order day one, but it's going to break in, in month four. And now, depending on where we are, especially in New York, to replace that HVAC unit, you have to bring in a crane. You have to get an engineer, an architect involved. Yeah, It's way too expensive. So I think landlords need to be a little more reasonable with certain things like that. I also know the back end calculations of if you get a higher rent, it, you're getting a higher return on your on your money from a valuation standpoint on your property. Mm -hmm. So we as a tenant are willing to pay the extra five hundred or a thousand dollars a month, and we know that a thousand dollars a month is twelve thousand a year, on a five or a six cap. That's two hundred thousand dollars in value to your building when you cash out refi in a year. So yeah. give us 25000 in build-out money, right. and we'll pay higher rent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, What this comes down to, and it's a plug for myself and it's a plug for you, but the reality is you should be using a good broker. <laughs> yeah. You should be using a good attorney. And if you want to open an ACE shop, you probably shouldn't do it yourself. You probably should consider buying a franchise mm -hmm. because you have the systems. You're going to catch things that maybe you just – that experience is really the only thing that can get you there. Correct. I mean, the HVAC thing, I mean, there's so many things that in leases that I see that are, that are missed that are horrible. I mean, I just saw someone sign a full 10 year personal guarantee with absolutely no limits on anything. I mean, so many things that were missed. Yeah. So, I mean, it, there's countless things as far as that goes. So if you're somebody that's, that maybe is interested in exploring a franchise, definitely speak to Billy. Two last questions that we'd love to know. Um, one, we always find that there's common trends with entrepreneurs. I'm curious, what is your what does your day to day look like? You know, as far as obviously craziness with business, but what does that look like? Your your habits, yeah, your morning things routine. you do. Yeah. Well, I'm, I my, I always tell my father, you know, I didn't go on the fire department, but I'm still a fireman because I just put fires out all day long. <laughs> yeah. Um, my my routine. So, um, I I'm not the best morning person. I'll just be honest with you. Are, yeah. You know, my brain doesn't shut off at night and I'll continue working late. So I like to, you know, wake up at a reasonable time and I love to make breakfast for my wife and my daughter and be a part of the morning routine. That's cool. Um, then I, I immediately go to my office and what I like to do every week is schedule set office days. Um, those set days that I'm in the office in front of my computer, I can get so much done. But in meeting with prospective franchisees, looking at locations, traveling around, I know that I can't be in the office five days a week. So it's very important that I have those, you know, one or two days that are set office days. Same. And, same. Yeah. Super yeah. valuable. And, and then again, I think, you know, I don't like to give cookie cutter advice because everyone's a little different. Um, so I started in, in putting a habit of putting my phone on do not disturb at a certain time at night. 
Same. Um, Nine o'clock. I, I think that's very important for your relationship with your, you know, your your partner, your kids, so on and so forth. And your sanity. And your sanity. I'm a little bit psychotic. I actually, I, I love living in the chaos. So when I have a lot of projects going on, like right now we have a bunch of stores being built out and all new leases being signed, I'll typically leave the phone on, God forbid. But um, the biggest piece of advice I can give anyone who's starting a business is hire really, really good people. Because I'd rather make 20% less and have 80% less headaches. Yep. Hire and slow, fire fast. There you go. And then last one, we always do this. Um, any kind of funny, crazy, ironic story, in whether it's with Baya or anything in your life. Yeah, this is a good one. So I, I had an idea of kind of what I was going to say coming here, but it, it just changed in the moment. Okay. When I left Wall Street, before I left Wall Street, I'm sorry, I had got crushed oil went from $100 a barrel down to $30 a barrel. And every small and mid-cap company that we bought into was blown to pieces. Um, my whole book of business was blown to pieces, personal money gone, family money gone. I was in a bad place. I, against my will, decided to go on a quick trip to clear my head. My buddy convinced me, let's, let's go on a trip, let's go on a trip, let's go on a trip. So we're, we were supposed to go to Austin, Texas. Spend a couple days, clear my head, come home. Mm -hmm. We used to fly standby. His best friend was a flight attendant. My cousin's a flight attendant. So we used to always fly standby for like 50 bucks. So the night before, you have to always check to make sure the seats don't get booked. So the seats weren't booked, but we checked the weather and it was raining the whole week in Austin. And I turned to him I'm like, dude, I am not leaving my business and Wall Street for a few days where I need to be there putting out fires and rebuilding my book to go hang out, in the to rain. go hang out in the rain. So in the literally the night before we switched the trip to San Diego, we go to San Diego and aside from me seeing some bowl shops and getting inspiration, the last night in San Diego, we're at this rooftop bar. So San Diego has some of the most breathtaking sun. I never uh, been sunsets. Heard. It's great. It's yeah. unbelievable. We're at this rooftop bar and there's not a seat available. We have this little four top. And this couple comes over. Hey, can we share this table with you? There's no seats. Yeah, of course. My buddy starts BSing with the wife. I start BSing with the husband. Really humble guy. And uh, I, I have to reach out to this guy at some point in life. We, we start talking and um, he starts telling me his story. He came from the Netherlands. Everyone from where he's from, bankers he decided to go into engineering i go okay everyone where i'm from is cops and firemen or street guys i decided to go in finance so i could re I, I can relate and um he comes to america he manufactures and distributes led light bulbs comes here with fifty thousand dollars in inventory cannot sell one light bulb he's here for seven months he's down and out he's going to go home a failure just like i'm talking to him he talks to a guy at a bar the last few weeks of staying in America, the guy says, why don't you upload everything to this website called Amazon? He goes, who's going to buy light bulbs on Amazon? The guy takes pictures of all of his inventory, uploads it to Amazon. First day he goes live, he sells one light bulb. Second day, one light bulb. Fourth day, two light bulbs. Tenth day, five light bulbs. He turns to me, he says, that was three years ago. So I said, how many light bulbs are you selling a day now? Really humble guy. He like didn't want to really get it. I go, listen, I really need this. I'm in a weird place right now. I need this. He was on pace to do $32 million in sales for the year. Wow. Unbelievable. I shook his hand. I said, thank you. I'm quitting my job when I go home. He was like, please don't do that. We went to return the bikes that we rented. We came back. He was gone. I don't know if he's a real person. Um, I went home. Quit Wall Street, started buy a bar. My wife walked in buy a bar three days later. Wow. And the rest is history. Epic story. So if it wasn't raining in Austin, Texas, that's this right. might not be happening right now. It's a great story. It's, it's not, it's, that's a mic drop. <laughs> Thanks for coming in, man. This was awesome.